three here. Hello. Hi. Welcome to our Artist in the Lab series of talks. My name is Linnea West, and I work in public programs here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, this talk series highlights the voices of artists who are considering what the future could look like, and it gives us a chance to expand on some of the ideas in the exhibition, Designs for Different Futures. Um, tonight, Orkan Telhan is with us as our artist in the lab. He curated a major installation within the exhibition titled Breakfast Before Extinction that demonstrates the possibilities of cellular agriculture. Projects in this section consider new modes of food production and ultimately how biology, technology, and design might come together to shape the future of food. So it is a delight to introduce Orkan. He is an interdisciplinary artist, designer, and researcher. His investigations focus on the design of interrogative objects, interfaces, and media, and they engage with critical issues in society. Orkan is an associate professor of fine arts and emerging design practices at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. He holds a PhD in design and computation from MIT, and he's also a co-founder of BioRealize. Orkan's individual and collaborative work has been exhibited internationally in venues including the Istanbul Biennial, the Istanbul Design Biennial, Milano Design Week, Vienna Design Week, the Armory Show, Ars Electronica, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, and the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, in addition to, of course, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I'm going to hand over the podium to Orkan, and he'll talk for about 35 minutes. Um, save any questions for the end, and we'll pass around some mics. Um, and just be sure to silence your cell phones if you haven't already. So Orkan, please. Thank you. And I will clap for you. <laughs> Thank you, Linnea. Thank you, PMA, for the kind invite. I love this intimate setting. Uh, so I would like to tell you a little bit about my involvement with the project, the bigger picture, and then I will focus a lot about my installation. So as Linnea mentioned, I am a designer, and I've been involved with designs with different futures since the beginning, for the past uh, three, four years, since its inception. Uh, Throughout the talk, I will talk a little bit about why and how I got involved with the process, but it's very important to start with the fact that this for me was an important uh, project to understand what it means to be a designer, different from an artist, different from a scientist, what does it mean to think the world and the future of the world through the lens of design, and ultimately make some uh, contributions to it, and however, we're, wherever, wherever we see, we can make a difference. So, why are we interested in design and why are we interested in food? I would uh, like to think that the most important thing that we did in the history of design is we designed ourselves. We designed ourselves by the, from the things that we eat, from the things that we didn't eat, what we consume, what we choose not to consume. So the world around us is all about the things that we prefer or things that we like to have in our life. So we design ourselves and through designing ourselves, we change the world around us. And the most important thing about designing ourselves is our diet. So then the work that I contributed to the exhibition is called Breakfast Before Extinction. It's a table uh, which with a number of different stations, you can go upstairs and see it. And these are objects, maybe scenes or stages that emphasize uh, or foreground a couple of sm small little stories that are about our preferences about our human diet. So what do I mean? So these are not about mediations on food, but more about our diet. So what does it mean again for us to decide in a crowded planet with lack of resources, you know, environmental pollution, biodiversity, with all these different problems that we are hearing, what does it mean for us to think about our relationship to our diet and through that our relationship to the big world? So the title may actually sound a bit dire or pessimistic. I get this question all the time, but it's really an optimistic way of to think about what can we do before we arrive to that extinction? Is there because we still have some time if we can think about these things. So the important thing to meant to look at in this picture is that projection behind the table, which is by the Malt magazine, which is also a contributor to the exhibition, which had a manifesto that made us think about the planets in 2050 when there will be 10 billion people trying to survive all at the same time. 
So the table is before this projection. So people who enter into this room see both the table and the projection and think the relationship between what's been said on the manifesto and what they see in front of the table. So in a crowded planet, how do we think about relationship to the food through the lens of these objects? So I'll talk about three projects from this table. And hopefully, um, if time permits, you can ask me more questions. And we will go upstairs, and then you can, you can ask me questions there. And not every project is my own. So I will start with a collaboration between Andrew Pelling, a scientist in Canada, Knight, a product designer, and myself. So this is 2020. And we all think about alternatives to food, to meat. Some of you might be vegetarians. Every year I ask my class, how many people are vegetarians, how many are vegans? And the numbers go less and less. You know, they are more meat eaters than vegetarians, surprisingly. But we are talking about future, right? So we, in the future, we will run into issues about feeding all these people on the planet with meat, with protein. But the way we think about meat is changing rapidly. Uh, the project that I have been following for the past um, 10 years uh, is, a few, uh, is called lab-grown meat, where people are not thinking about killing animals to get the, the meat as a meat source, but rather culturing their cells in a lab environment so that you can grow your meat from cells, from cell lines without killing any animals. So I've been following this ideology for a while. I'm thinking about, like, okay, what does it mean to really grow your burger or steak in a petri dish instead of like killing an animal. It sounds great, right? But as a designer, it's always important to really inquire or question a bit further than when, what things, how things are presented to us. So when I talk to the experts in the field and, the, uh, and the people who are criticizing the work that's going on in the, in, the, in the media, they pointed out the fact that you can grow cells in a dish like this, but you need to feed them with something. And the serum that you use to feed from these cells are not necessarily something made of scratch. It needs to come also from animals. So you don't kill animals, but maybe you need to kill animals to be able to kill, to feed your cells. So I'm just going to cover that image so that you don't have to look at ugly pictures. So uh, ugly but realistic pictures. Um, FBS, the fecal bovine serum, comes from unborn bovines, where the blood is extracted in horrible ways, and then turned into a serum, which can then use be feeding these cells. So lab-grown meat requires FBS to actually become a viable technology. So the problem is, is that it's not only cruel, but it's also very, very expensive. So one, 500 milliliters, this is just one bottle. And to be able to grow in your steak, you need a lot of FBS. So alternatives to blood, animal blood, is human blood. And we did the math, and it looks like the human blood is much, much cheaper. So now, now all of a sudden, we are, as designers, ready for a value proposition. We can make you think about, instead of the poor little animal, you have your own blood at display. And of course, we are not suggesting anyone to give, you know, take your blood in a cruel way. There's tons of blood in hospitals that are expired because they are taken for transplantations, but they expire because if they are not used on time. So blood is, in certain places, a waste material. So now we have some ingredients, we have a technology, we have a platform. Welcome to the future of OroChef. This is a website, this is a platform, like uh, Blue Apron, you can order a little kit where it comes with a, a little set of tools that allow you to extract your own cells and grow them with your own blood so that you can make the best cultured version of yourself. I will explain the details, so don't worry too much about how it works, but your kit arrives home and in about three, four months, you can get a little bit of meat to consume. So these are state-of-the-art mycelium scaffolds, meaning that your cells need to grow on something. So I'm giving some technical details. They need to grow on something. 
And these are specially grown out of mycelium, a very special material now. It's used on all kinds of things from packaging to building materials. But it's also a good material for, you know, growing cells. This mycelium is grown by a company um, in the US. They are shipped, they're, if you pay attention to the details, they look like little snakes. You know, they're like Ouroboros snakes. They, they designed them in, a, in the company logo, so they look like products. And they are grown using real human cells with uh, expired serum so that you can actually see them and taste them if you like. In about three, four months, they become into this and you can see their finalized versions upstairs. This is a moment to really reflect on because I told you about a narrative. I told you about like a commodification of a process. Similar to the Blue Apron story, I told you that in the future you may actually take your cells and grow your own meat. But I'm not trying to propose this as a solution. I'm not telling you that this is the way to go. As a designer, my responsibility is to imagine or make you think about hard problems. I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to say that this is the way to go. It is a way to go if we don't change our behavior. So, my main contribution to the project not, was not only designing the stage, but also create an cre environment where people can critically reflect on themselves while they are, uh, you know, enjoying the project. So what does that mean? When we are looking for a sustainable solution, which could, uh, for, so for protein consumption, for finding a source for meat, the most sustainable solution could actually be your own cells and expired human blood but that will not be the most culturally accepted solution, right? Most of, most of the people who look at the project tell me that, oh, this is like cannibalism. It's technically not cannibalism because you're not eating somebody else, you're eating yourself. So it's not that different from um, eating your own hair or biting your fingernails, except they're more nutritious. Real human cells, real human blood, but don't forget, you're also in front of a mirror. You can also watch yourself eating yourself in a contemplative manner. This is a commentary on the future where a lot of people are choosing to eat at home by themselves in lonely setups. A lot of different things all staged in one place. But again, it's not a proposition, it's a provocation, a story that is told by real objects as opposed to an image, a video, or a documentation. So as designers, we care a lot about especially in this exhibition as, cura as, cur as a curatorial team, we focus a lot on bringing things into a gallery environment, a museum environment, where people can let the objects speak about certain things as opposed to being told what they should perceive or interpret as messages. So in the theme of meat and protein, I decided to talk to you the second project, also along the same lines. Very different, but along the same lines. In the, in the, but I, then I, do, for the presentation, I decided that, okay, if I, or can talk, if I talk, talk, talk all the time, but not show you any videos, I realized that it might actually get boring. So I will play a video first, so that you can see it. approval is incredibly disappointing. The approval was irresponsible and flawed. If these GMO salmon escape, they could cause devastating environmental harm to wild salmon populations. They're more susceptible to disease and deformities. They have potential health problems. retail chains have already committed to not selling GMO salmon despite the fact that the FDA has now approved it and consumers have said they won't eat it. So I'll tell you about 
the salmon story. I encountered this 10 years ago when I was writing my dissertation and I really loved the fish. And I, of course, as a designer, became a salmon geek and explored the story for many years. And it's the first time I had the opportunity to introduce the world how it looks like. But let's watch another video. <coughs> the alternative to eating salmon. So this morning when I was talking to my students, everyone was talking about orcan. You should not tell people how to eat. You should tell them how to catch fish. But now we are living in a world where we have to catch them fish without over harvesting them. So 2050 is when there will be no fish, wild fish in the ocean. So whether we like it or not, your children or your children's children is, are going to, will never be able to eat fish like this. So they will go into salmon that is going to be farmed or genetically modified in uh, special tanks. So I can tell you the story and I can show you many different news clips about this, but I decided to really get the fish, see it by myself, see myself, and actually present it first time in the US, maybe it's first time in the world, in, not in a video format, but in an actual presence, so you can see actually how a genetically modified salmon looks like. They arrive like normal fish in a dried way, and eventually um, they look, you know, when you thaw them and then you, you know, hold in your hand, they look exactly like a normal salmon. There's nothing different between them. But in the video, as they were eluding, it, when it's genetically modified, they are actually introduce two additional genes that are coming from another salmon, the Chinook salmon, and a cousin fish, which just looks like similar to eel. So two additional genes come in and make you a genetically modified salmon. But a genetically modified salmon doesn't really look that much different. But to be able to make a fish look like a good design object in an exhibition, it is, it's not an easy task. So you have to inject many, many different injections uh, a lot of chemicals so that it can retain its beautiful color, its beautiful shimmer. And then, and then you need to stitch it, close it. It's almost like preparing for funeral. And ultimately present it so that people can ask themselves which one is better. A normal salmon that is small and in the container on the left, and the bigger salmon that is coming from, that came all the way from Canada, Prince Edward Islands, with a special permission because uh, by, when we were planning on the exhibition, there was really no permission to import salmon, genetically modified salmon to the US. So it is like an illegal immigrant that had to get special permission to be able to fly into the exhibition with special, uh, special paperwork. It is preserved with a lot of diligence and it's going to last forever. So. Two salmons had sacrificed their lives to be able to make a case about this. So why is this important? Going back to better salmon. 2050, we may all afford eating the fish, the small fish that is coming from the fish tank, and we can all feel natural and good about this. But a lot of people in the world who may not have the money or the desire, or the people in the video told you, they eat eel and they eat salmon. Why don't you eat a combined version? So again, my role is not to say, pick a side and make a decision, but ask yourself which, which one is going to be better if you are going to make a decision and if there's going to be no salmon that is, can be harvested or uh, catched from the ocean. So my task was to bring these two siblings, also I have to mention that these are siblings that, are, that were taken from the same parents and after manipulation, we have to make sure that they are comparable. So that because the, the genetically modified salmon grows twice as big, then all of a sudden it becomes this big giant monster, and you cannot really compare them unless you buy you get siblings at the same time. Very special attention was needed to be able to really bring this right, you know, right into the place here, so I can see it. From fish to from meat to fish, moving towards like what does it mean to make other kinds of decisions. The third project that I'm going to talk about is not about transforming something or making a decision about transforming something, but going back to how do we transform ourselves with new technologies that you can 
actually have more control over it at home by, your, by yourself. So a lot of us worry about like things that are happening somewhere else. People are manipulating our food. People are changing our diet. But also they are coming from a culture where we manipulate our own bodies through our diet by consuming vitamins, consuming supplements, consuming hormones to be able to really affect ourselves in a completely different way. So what happens if these new kinds of explorations became accessible if you have the tools to be able to do these things at home? So when you go upstairs, you see this little pill box that shows you a number of different baked goods. We call them simit. I'll explain them in a second. Next to a machine that shows you how to in, uh, engineer organisms and different chemicals so that you can mix them up and consume so that you can have other abilities. You can ask yourself, why should I change my, my, why should I add different kinds of things to my food? Why should I change my body? First of all, we do this all the time since the beginning of times. In the 80s, vitamins were cool. In the 90s, now we, in the 2000s, we care about probiotics. But the important thing is that it's now a revolution in the counter because now you can do these things at home. So I sound like a travel, traveling salesman because I want to sound like a traveling salesman because this is the time where you can really act on things. So what do I mean by acting? Well, what happens if you start thinking about growing these things on your own where you can make your own medicine? Insulin. 70% of diabetic 1, uh, diabetic 2 patients actually have to, are consuming insulin that is made by genetically modified organisms somewhere else in the world in biopharmaceutical company in big tanks, similar to this small device that I showed you a second ago. So what happens instead of being dependent on these companies, you can start doing things on your own. What happens if you start growing your own vitamins at home? What happens if you start experimenting with the real research that is happening in you know, universities where you can get an organism, grow at home and actually figure out how, how much longer you can live. Resveratrol is a chemical that uh, people are researching very lately. It comes from grapes, and it actually is proven to extend life of mice quite a bit. So if you're into extending your life, you can grow some organisms, mix into your bread, and actually consume. And of course, um, if I had the whole time, I can talk, dedicate an entire project on this, because ultimately, if you really want to transform yourself further, we know that probiotics, our gut microbiome, are, are, is the way to go. And there's a lot of people who exchange microorganisms with each other so that they can change their hormone levels. Instead of taking um, testosterone or estrogen from the uh, uh, pharmaceutical treatment, because sometimes they don't have access to those treatments, so the only way they can access this is actually a second, like a second-hand. Uh, fecal transplant that they can acquire from their friends or loved ones or a network of supporters. What happens if you enable this and support this so that people can grow their organisms and consume them? So the machine that I showed you upstairs is actually something that is like a product. You can really imagine this in your kitchen counter and test all kinds of things with it. So from the meat and the salmon where things look distant and speculative and imaginary now you're looking at something that is really right at the counter so my designer imagination also wants you to think that future is not as far as you think future is something that is actable and something that is actually workable so that once you start participating in it but not, not everyone has the tools or the knowledge to be able to participate in the future so the exhibition is all about increasing that knowledge and our abilities to join the conversations about future. If you're not, even if you're not going to use it, you can participate in the future by actually understanding what is going on with these tools when they become accessible to others. A couple of pictures from my kitchen when I grow some organisms and put them into these things, bake them and make them ready. A couple of videos of things that you can do when you have a tool like this. There's a number of them. There's a pill box has seven, eight of them. So every week you can have one and you can watch these videos upstairs when you go and see them. Um, there's another one. It shows you how different 
you, you can introduce organisms there, micro, sometimes microorganisms, sometimes um, a group of microorganisms, you call them consortia, so that you can transform yourself from within. So this is a design process. I'm giving you a design tool, or thinking about a design tool where you can actually start designing from within. So I will, I talked about a couple of different things, but I would like to um, really bring them all together a little bit so that you uh, have a better sense of asking questions and you know, engage in a conversation. When we start thinking about the exhibition, when we were trying to look at the list of objects to bring into the space, we ask ourselves, what is our responsibility as curators or what is our responsibility as designers to ask other designers to bring, to invite into the space? And one thing that came up was imagination. Designers' role is um, to extend the imagination of their audiences. So this is not my phrase, but um, I heard this in a talk uh, a couple of days ago that imagination is a battlefield. Imagination is something that we really have to work very hard. You, as with designers, we construct objects and artifacts that create other people's imagination. So I have a big responsibility to extend the imagination of other people. So this show is mainly about really extending our parameters of the imagination so that we don't get trapped in somebody else's worldview or vision. If I were here to sell you the steaks that make you eat yourself, then I will be selling yourself one version of the future, but it's, that's not the point. My role is to really extend the imagination, the parameters of the imagination, so we can all act on extending our imagination so that we, can, we don't get trapped in the whole thing. So I have a lot of thanks. I will thank to the fellow curators who invited me into this project. And then uh, the museum staff, the exhibition designers, and everyone at the PMA who is under-acknowledged and underappreciated, like every institution. I have benefited from a lot of different people. And these are my collaborators who I you know, worked quite a bit, my interns, my assistants. But there's also a group of non-humans that I need to acknowledge. Uh, the cells that are coming, that were grown on the, onto the scaffolds, the oro chef cells, are coming from a person, from an actual human being, who was under-acknowledged for, for many, many years. Henrietta Lacks was an African-American person whose cells were taken without consent and grown in many different scientific research for decades. There's a lot of interesting movies about her. So, it's now a common scientific tool that people use. So instead of growing our own cells, because we really grow real cells on those, uh, on those stakes um, and repelling the this in, uh, in Canada, and we need to cite them. Of course, we don't have names, but the big salmon and the small salmon, the siblings need some further acknowledgement. Uh, you are not looking at them. I spent an entire summer working with bananas. If you have questions about bananas, I promised the organizers that I'm going to keep it really short. I'm not going to talk about bananas because it can go out of control. I have slides. If you have asked a few questions, I can show them to you. But the Cavendish family, the Gross Michel family, the banana family, I have, um, I really am grateful for them. I consumed many, many of them. <laughs> and the billions of billions of organisms that I grew in my little incubator uh, for all kinds of things from growing vitamins to probiotics. So they were all very much involved. So I will stop here. I know it's a bit early, but I will have, I will welcome to your questions. It's an intimate group. I love that it's an intimate group. So you can ask me all kinds of questions about these projects and also the other pieces in the installation. And of course, if you have questions about bananas, I am ready to answer. <laughs> all right. Thank I mean, you. we're a smaller group, but I'm happy to pass around the mic too. I'm also happy to kick it off with my burning question. Yeah. So the um, the bioreactor thing that anybody could mm -hmm. grow their own whatever. Could someone like myself with very little knowledge actually do that? How oh. close is it to being something that the lay person? So my use? collaborator is not in the room, so I can tell you all the secrets. So it is actually a company. It's a product that people commercially buy and we sell it. So it's not for you yet because you know, you may have less reasons to do it. But we work a lot with people who are 
grow, making beer, wine, cheese, and so on. It's home use and it doesn't require anyone to uh, any knowledge. But uh, I told you that I'm like a traveling salesman now and I can be a traveling salesman if I want to. But the most important is that it's a very critical tool because a critical tool is not some, any fabrication tool is a very critical tool because it enables to, to act, test, and work with things. We are not very used to it, but you can think of it like a 3D printer. You can do all kinds of things with it. It helps you to learn as well. So after using the tool for a while, you will become more and more accustomed to it because we are very happy to swallow the pills usually. We have no idea what's on those pills and we have a lot of trust into the system. But we sometimes know that those things don't, our trust is not, in a, in a world full of after post-truth, trust is a negotiable term. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, let me try to put my thoughts together because, like, it's maybe. I mean, I'm gonna kind of try to, like, you know, make a remark and ask a question on mm -hmm. at the same time, um, and also like go back to my own personal life a little bit. As you know, I, you know, I breastfeed right now, and since, like, you know, that happened, and I have this creature that I have to supply something from my own body, I. Like, you know, started thinking critically about the fluids that I, 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 I have sure. the ability to, to produce. And, I, and I've been like, you know, sit, finding myself sitting and thinking, what if I stopped feeding him and feeding myself? Uh, how, how long would I like, you know, would, would, would my own milk, like, you know, if I also consume water, <laughs> keep me alive? Like, how long can I consume my own milk and like, you know, survive? I've, I've been thinking. So I was like sort of applying this um, notion of, maybe like sustainability of what I produce and consume to the like, you know, uh, cultured meat that you were um, talking about and like, you know, and, and you have to feed your own blood to it, right? So it's kind of like, like, like kind of mimics the, the, the capitalism, like, you know, the way it like consumes the earth material mm -hmm. and to a degree that there is no longer productivity left in that area, right? Yeah. So like, um, yeah, I know it's kind of not cannibalism, but sort of has this cannibalistic mode of like, you know, producing to exhaust, exhausting the, the supply, yeah. right? Um, so if let's say we really are so, like socially, like, as an entire society committed to grow our cultured meat in, in the home environment with our own, like, you know, bodily supply, how, how, how sustainable would that be is, is kind of my question. I mean, I didn't do the math, but I can tell <laughs> you it's hard for me to play scientist because I really want to make sure that you don't see me as a scientist. You don't, I'm not here to tell you what's really the truth. My, my social contract with the society is a designer. I am going to tell you what is possible, what is what is not possible, what we should worry about, or what we can imagine. So your answer should be answered, your question should be answered more scientifically. But I know that you need to consume more protein than that those little things that grow only in four months. So it will never catch up with your protein needs, unless you have other people's cells that are grown somewhere else, which can become marketable and consumable and so on, where it goes back to capitalism. Right? Somewhere else in the world, while we're in the room, somewhere else in the world is giving away their labor or their cells in some other way. So if you extract and expand and consume other resources all the time, you cannot really do this sustainably. That, but the important gesture is that by pointing it out, is it the culturally, is it the more environmentally sustainable solution or is it the more culturally sustainable solution? That dilemma of sustainability, which one do we prefer, is very important. It's a big question because some of us are like, yucky, I will not do this. But some of us are also okay with like seeing that bovine picture, right? You know, I didn't want to show you that bovine picture, but at some point it's like, you know, it's okay to be tough every once in a while. You know, we should, we should f face with these things because a lot of stuff happens behind the scenes. Uh, thank you, Okan, again this, for this great talk. Um, my question is about the, the previous, like similar to the previous question you had um, about that mm, machine that you've been creating. Um, what, I mean, first of all, I have two questions related to each other. Like, do you think this will be uh, your your product will be an Alexa for bio design, something like this, like popular, can be used by many people in their kitchen or something, you know, in their houses. And if you think so, if you think that this is one of the maybe possible paths for your work, 
for that particular product. Uh, how do you imagine that future? Like, what what, what can what, what might what might change in society when you have this kind of this much popular? You know, everybody is self designing, self creating. There are many things like they cook. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and then what is that feature like? So the first question is, um, I don't know if this product will be successful or not. I'm not. So, I don't really care that much about this. Of course, everyone wants their products to be popular. But I know that whether it's this or somebody else's, these kind of products will be on your kitchen counters in 10 years. Take my word. I might be wrong, but I'm very, very sure that something like this will be in your house. It may not be growing the insulin because making your own medicine is tough. It takes a long time, but computers were gigantic and now they're in your pocket. It's in a matter of time, things progress. So, we will be fabricating our own chemicals at some point. It's, there's no way that we do this. But of course, there will be restrictions, there will be safety regulations, ethic regulations, and so on. There, it's very important that we do these things popular, uh, pr properly. If you ask me, which I think it's an important question, what happens to be living in a future like this, I would worry about at th when that time arrives, what will be the future that will come after that? But if we arrive to that future, like where everyone is designing their stuff, then we can look back, look forward and say, okay, where are we going with this? Are we going, are we giving up all our uh, production, food production? We don't grow plants anymore. We don't kill animals anymore. We just eat, we turn into astronauts and consume our own powders. That looks like a terrible solution, right? Because food is culture, food is society, food is, food is expression. So we don't want to give those up because we want to just have a more efficient, more optimized way of living. So I don't, <laughs> this is the end of the talk. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, the important thing is that how do we incorporate these kind of things into our lives and actually change our lives in an interesting way as opposed to turning ourselves into food consuming robots. But the part, the, the, the accessibility thing is very important. Right now we have an asymmetry in information and also asymmetry in the tools. Hopefully these kind of tools will make people not only transform only their bodies, but maybe start thinking about what does it mean to produce? What does it mean to become fabricators or producers? Because humans have always been making, have always, we're always making their food before they move into those big cities, right? I mean, like we, we had a relationship with food making for a long time. Maybe we will start thinking about this in a different way. Maybe instead of like over consuming bananas or finishing, and banana, <laughs> over-consuming bananas and, um, you know, driving certain uh, animals or species into extinction, we will find supplements and alternatives to that. I think for that purpose, I think it's going to be important to really explore these technologies. <laughs> this was a seed. No, <laughs> please go. All right. Hi. Um... So I'm currently a student here in, in Philly, and um, I'm like really interested in bioinnovation and and like going into this field. Um, and so I guess I guess my question is two has two parts. Um, so I guess for like the the bioreactor, I'm kind of wondering like what uh, like you mentioned with the the Simit diet, like the applications in in food. Um, and I was wondering what other applications do you uh, see people uh, like applying or using your tool mm -hmm. for and then like I guess um, do you think that this bioreactor could be something like used in schools and like um, like letting students experiment on their own? Mm -hmm. They actually use it in the schools. Thank you for this question. It's um, I was very the, call, the talk is very contained right I didn't, I'm not talking anything outside food but the, the technology itself is mostly about growing microorganisms and there are microorganisms for making biomaterials microorganisms for making, um, you know, storing information. You know, DNA could be used for storing information or making, comp so there's a lot of applications. So we test out in my classes uh, at Penn, I teach biological design, and we look at different uh, possibilities. What does it mean to grow organisms and prototype with them uh, new kinds of materials and new kinds of applications. So um, it is, think of it, Computers started as like breaking code and punching numbers and very, you know, 
very boring stuff, and now they're like driving the entire world. Microorganisms have always been driving the world and creating the stuff, but we had no access to it. We didn't really know what they were doing. So now we are learning this. That's why it's important. As the research about microorganisms progress, you learn how to work with them, and you should be able to grow them at home so that you can start testing them around. Because you don't want to rely on you know, somebody else's work. You should be able to, as a designer, you should be able to do this and uh, practice it at home to be able to test your own ideas. As designers, it's important for us to be able to really bring that te those technologies back at home. And yeah, ca catch me afterwards and I can tell you more about what else can be done. Hi, this is really interesting. So um, <clears throat> on a practical level, I'm wondering whether anything has thus far been created which actually requires less energy or calories to create than it actually offers when it's made. Which one are you referring to? Well, is there anything that making it doesn't cost more than a way of achieving it as it stands? In, in the food world? In, well, food in, or vitamins? Ah, or you're talking about the reactor. Ah, right? uh, uh, in any way, when any you way. talk about sustainability. Ah. So th that's an interesting question because we don't, in, in, if you pay attention to the biological world, it's never about making something out of nothing. You, sac you give, you feed organisms with sugar and they turn sugar into vitamins. So you have to always feed them with something. The cells that you grow as steak need to you know, be fed by blood. So you have to always make a cost-benefit analysis. Like what am I feeding them with and what am I achieving at the end? So sustainability is a measure of that. How much you consume and how much you actually need to spend to be able to produce the thing so that you don't end up consuming more than you would produce. So you have to make that balance so that you can diversify your resources so that you don't have to exploit one little thing. So microorganisms are good with that because microorganisms can sometimes you know, just use sunlight to make things, sometimes use sugar to make things. So there's abundant amount of materials on the planet. But Feeding animals, feeding cows, other things are very resource intensive and they produce a lot of methane and all kinds of issues with that. So you need to make, you need to cha change or channel the way we make things. And there's definitely more sustainable versions of production than others. I have a design question mm -hmm. though. Um, as a designer, um, how do you achieve a synergistic effect that you feel like really does reflect um, personality and thought that is particular. Synergistic effect. Um, more than the sum of its parts. When you make these things, oh. um, I don't know if that's a concern, but as a designer, I would assume that there's a kind of thing communicated, which is more than merely what it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. I don't know how I can answer this quickly. But what I really care about is, is not what point to something. You don't look at my finger, but look at where I'm pointing at. So my object, the objects that I create or invite other people to create with are things, of course, bigger than their parts, right? They're aesthetic objects. They provoke certain things, but it's mostly about like making people think about certain things. So I care a lot about making things that actually make people think about issues as opposed to think about them as solutions. So in that respect, a tiny little thing could be a metaphor for a larger thing. So I'm not too concerned about like, even if it's a machine, it's of course means much more than what it does. It stands for an entire system of fabrication, consumption, production, and so on. Um, hi, so the bioreactor seems a popular topic. <laughs> um, so technologies themselves aren't necessarily inherently good or bad. It's what people choose to do with it. Mm -hmm. And when you democratize your technology, you open it up to many more people, which can have as many good or, or bad consequences. So I'm wondering, from your point of view as a designer, what are your sort of moral and ethical considerations by opening technology up for anyone to use? In, in the same way that 3D printers are being used to make firearms and things like that. Yeah. I, 
I constantly answer this question almost on a daily basis. And depending on the day, I probably give a different answer because I'm always concerned about things. The easy, safe answer that I rely on is dual use. We use this term all the time, dual use. You, I can give you a bread knife and you, you can cut use for cutting bread or you can stab a person. Right? It's intention. The tool is in, in, in the eye of the beholder and, or whatever its capacity is determined based on your intention. But of course, some tools are more powerful than the others. So there are certain microorganisms that are really bad. They can cause you diarrhea or they can cause other kind of problems. But having access to these organisms are not so easy. So I can give you the tool to grow the organisms, but having access to the ingredients is limited, is restricted. You can genetically modify organisms, but the DNA that you want to synthesize to put inside the organisms are coming from gene synthesis companies that are regulated. Their databases are regulated, so you cannot actually get order a Wuhan virus DNA to be printed out by a gene synthesis company. So there's different checks and balances in the system. But for the malicious user, there's always a way to go in there. You're right. I am with you. I am concerned about this, but I'm also concerned about like how um, we need to enable people in the future so that they, we can build different kind of countermeasures because pharmaceutical industry is not going to go away, but pharmace pharmaceutical industry changes its behavior when the people start to put different kinds of pressures out there. So I am ethically responsible both ways to make a tool that is ethical or used in a way and also enabling other people because that's an also a designer the responsibility to empower so that we can have a more equitable future. Not my future, but your future, everyone's future. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the tough crowd. I mean, you um, cited the um, non-human um, aid to your project. And I mean, it wasn't going to be all right if I don't ask a question about <laughs> it. Um, so what changes for the microorganisms if we uh, decentralize the technologies that you mentioned? Not ethically, but maybe more um, infrastructurally, I'm asking, or more environmentally, to be more exact. Yeah. So again, I answer the question differently in different times. Um, so it depends on who, who is the chicken, who is the egg. So one story would be that the organisms will use the technology to spread even more. You know, sometimes we think about humans are using yeast to make bread or wine or cheese. But because of our culinary culture, those organisms, this yeast, the baker's yeast, has spread all around the world. And many billions of other yeast types didn't survive this long. It's this mutual interaction, this mutual benefit between the human and the organism that let it survive. So in our guts, many, many organisms are surviving historically. And once they become probiotics, we collect them and they will continue living instead of going extinct. So it is a going to be a mutual evolution. And I am inclined to think that they are more in charge than us because we are the endangered species on this planet, not them because they've been around for billions of years, and humans will not be able to survive at some point, and we will pass the baton to somebody else. I hope I'm wrong this time. I hope I'm wrong. But we need to figure out how to survive on the planet. Everyone is worried about biodiversity loss. Humans will be the most important biodiversity loss on the planet. In a couple of thousand years, maybe no species will remember us. Wow. Time for one more question. Final question on that note. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I'm trying to think how to formulate this exactly, but um, so with the stake project, you have the presence of the HeLa cells, this long, there's a long history behind the materials that went into actually making the stakes. And, and the concept, of course, is that we make those um, stakes from our own cells, but the cells are hard to culture. Mm. Um, the salmon have another story uh, about their origin and about how they traveled and the history of how they came to be genetically modified. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could comment 
briefly on um, the connection between your two bananas, between the Gros Michel and the Cavendish, <laughs> which again, you know, there's a historical story there in that piece um, at, that I think is a very important to the commentary. So even as you're thinking about the future-oriented um, uh, aspect of each of the of, of the visions of what our, our breakfast might look like, um, there are these much longer histories that are brought forward in those stories as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Gros Michel, I think, is a rather interesting one. OK, one slide. Because we only have four minutes. So when you go upstairs, it's really 20 slides after this. Um, when you go upstairs, you will see two jars. Like the salmon, that's why that's where the connection is coming. There's a lot of things on this table that are presented in a comparative way. So you look at the left one and the right one, try to figure out what's going on. The one on the left is Cavendish, the one that you buy from a store. It's abundant, it's very cheap. And the one on the right is Gros Michel, which is at the brink of extinction, which came from one plantation in Miami once a month, so I take them, process them, and bring them to the museum. So the bananas, as you know, are very fast ripening fruits, so they have to be replaced. So every month, one Gros Michel came in there. The, 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 the most important part of the story is that because of our overconsumption, most of the time, we never, don't even know which bananas that we are eating. It's always the same banana. We are cloning and consuming exactly the same banana because of our human desires. We like the taste. But there's thousands of different banana types, but we only like uh, Cavendish. Gros Michel was the uh, popular banana in the 50s, 60s, but it lost a battle against a fungus infection, Fusarium. And now, technically, it's considered extinct because it's not financially viable to produce it anymore. The one on the left, Cavendish, which uh, Gros Michel was also cloned and reproduced exactly the same way for years. Cavendish is now we are doing exactly the same thing. But Fusarium, the mighty yeast, is also taking down Cavendish. So it's a matter of time that the one on the banana on the left that you can buy from Starbucks to Wawa, anywhere you like, will also go extinct. So the little timers underneath them are telling you the projected expiration date or extinction date of these fruits. So again, the story is not about like, which one do you prefer? One of them is already gone. It's not like the salmons where you have a choice to make. One of them is already gone and it's with great effort. It comes to the museum every month so we can present them to the public. Um, and the question is always, the decision is on you, not on my side. Which one do you eat? Which one do you choose to uh, consume and which one do you want uh, the future generations to consume because ultimately we decide which bananas are going to last there. So next time when you go and buy a banana from the store, look at its number. If it's 4011, let me see if I have that number. I don't have it probably. 4011, then it's a Cavendish. If, you're, if it's a different number, buy that one because that diversifies the consumption so that you we, it, it allows the banana, other bananas to survive on the planet so that your, your future generations can also eat banana. One slide. I have 20 <laughs> No, that was perfect. Right, um, we are out of time, um, but the exhibition is still open tonight in case you wanted to revisit it. The exhibition is also open through March 8th, so you have some more time to come back. Um, Orkan, thanks so much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you for the question.